Here we are, Mill Surf Garage. Continuing on with these uh, 22 parlor guns, gallery guns, uh, antique 22s, vintage 22 rifles. You call it what you want. This, this right here, this is going to take us into the wonderful realm of Marlin. That's right. Now this one is a Marlin 20A. There's a few that came before it and a whole ton of them that came after it. This is very early. This is early in the history of Marlin. And um, you go do some history. You could read big fat books on the history of Marlin. I'm going to touch on it here, but this is a uh, this is some old school ancient Marlin history when they were like competing in the 1800s, the late 1800s with like uh, Winchester's designs, lever, lever designs, that whole big war. This carried through into the uh, early part of the 1900s. And then uh, things changed with Marlin. They changed hands. They were bought out. And things started to change. But this is a leftover still from the old original Marlin you know clan and um, I'll show you some pictures and some books of who these players were I'll give you just a touch of the Marlin history but then uh, mostly we're just going to be poking around and looking at this guy uh, a couple of interesting things about this one it's uh well, first off, this one was made, this particular one, the Model 20A, was made from 1911 to 1922, and this happens to be a 1911 um, vintage. The cool thing about this guy is, like, I never really had to date it, um, even if it was hard to find exactly what numbers, if there weren't records to find out what numbers uh, corresponded to what dates. This serial number, this is the only odd serial number I have of any of my guns anywhere. This serial number is serial number 4. <laughs> so... Pretty uh, safe to assume it's from the first year of production, probably from the first day of production, you know what I mean? Um, so uh, it is a take town design, and uh, the numbers, let's see, I, I pull serial numbers from, let's see, I wrote down from where. I got it on the back of the butt plate, so that would be uh, on this actual butt plate, um, on the trigger group top tang under the wood so that would be this part here you see how it's separated with a line that this top part is the barrel assembly and this is like the trigger group so this is the receiver part this is the trigger group part there's a number on the tangs here on the trigger group on the buttstock wood so the buttstock the <clears throat> the um, butt plate and on the actual trigger group is that serial number, but the rest of it is not serial number. This whole removable barrel assembly part was not, uh, it was considered interchangeable or like a replaceable part, I suppose. So um, there is no uh, serial number on that. And of course, this was pre-1968, of course, the Gun Control Act of 1968, which required these serial numbers in certain spots and stuff like that. But unless they were imported... Um, none of that has changed, so the serial numbers are just on um, on those particular parts. They're all a four, and you know there is a difference in the patina of the steel. Um, you can see another part here. This is part would be the trigger group part, and this would be the receiver part. And you can see there is a difference in the patina. So who knows? It could be a separate part. Um, I know that this barrel was uh, relined. I don't know if you can see that close up. Let me take a look and make sure we're talking about the right rifle. Yes. This does look like it was relined, which um, is common, actually, with these older ones, because the 22 ammo from back in the day there, that old, that, that old stuff was very cor uh, corrosive. So I think even my 1914, uh, the, uh, the uh, Savage was, um, was also uh, relined if you remember in that video. So, um, I'd rather have it relined than have a dogged barrel. So, there we go. 
So um, let's let's see what else do I have on this one as far as uh, this takes short, long, and long rifle. And I don't have capacities written down here, so I never really uh, haven't really gotten around to check. But um, let's look at some of the specifics on this guy, and then we'll just move into a little bit of the history. Um, kind of all over the place with this video, but uh, man, this one blows my mind. I'm gonna do some cool stuff with this rifle, so hang in there. Look at this butt plate. Is that crazy? Oof. That's radical right there. Um, this is like the thinnest rifle you'll ever see. These things supposedly were like the lightest um, uh, repeater ever or something like that. It has some kind of like uh, distinction. So just one operating rod on this side and two screws on just this one side. So no screws holding it on on the other side. That's a little unique. Uh, octagon barrel. Show you what some of the script here says. If we can, if it focuses. Seems like it hasn't been doing too bad. 22 short, long, and long rifle. Here's the Marlin script on there. New Haven, Connecticut. Nice sight. Very finely adjustable sight on there. It's not one of those stepped ones. It's one of those ones with the screw, so... Very fine adjustments. All of these front sights like this uh, had some kind of ivory tip or something like that, or a brass tip. But they always had something. They're, they're all missing. Every single one of these that I have, they're all missing. That'd be really tough. You find one with uh, with that sight, original boy, and uh, you really uh, you really in business. Now you notice here, full length magazine which uh, we haven't seen yet. So somebody opted them. I believe this, like the others I have, it was available as an option. Seems like somebody had bought it, had got that option with this rifle. So we have the full length magazine tube. This of course is an exposed hammer and the uh, safety is the half cock position. It works perfectly. You can see the exposed uh, firing pin right here. And at half cock, it will not be contacted if you drop the rifle. Protects it, locks everything up. And uh, this rifle was in direct competition with Winchester's uh, 1890, of course. And um, it seems like they were playing catch up. It seemed like Marlin was always sort of playing catch up. They always had stuff that was competing with... Um, competing with uh, John Browning's designs, competing with Winchester. They were definitely like uh, Winchester contemporaries, you know what I mean? So um, let's break out some, some books. Let's show you some cool books. First of all, if you're interested in these 22s, this is a cool book. It's Bill Ward, Walnut and Steel, Vintage 22 Rifles. And then there's a follow-up that just became available. Walnut and Steel 2. I love these books. And they show this. There's a lot of information here. See on the... Uh, well, here... Here is him talking about the uh, Model 20. And uh, you see this. these books are cool. They break down. They show you the, the innards. Different, uh, different options. You know, they talk a lot about uh, little things that you might not find in any other books because these 22s are kind of forgotten. And then here it lists the whole list of talking about the Marlin 38, talking about the, the uh, number 20. It started its life as the number 18 um, in uh, 1908. That was only around for a couple of years, and then it became the number 20. That was only around for a couple of years. Then the 20A, which the, they're improvements. As it goes along, it's all improvements. And then the Model 25, 29, 37, 47, those were all 22s of this, this, you know, this same look. And they just would be, would have modifications as they went along to, uh, you know, make them better and better. Improvements as, as they went along, you know. But the 20A seems to be a good one. It kind of stayed there for a while if there were, there were a lot of changes. Now, you know what I like, uh... This is my Marlin book. This is Marlin Firearms Brophy. He was supposedly like, he was the guy. This guy was Marlin for a while. And I love these, uh, 
these type of uh, drawings like this. I, I, a lot of people, they see stuff like this, they skip right over it. I study these things. See, this is another cool book that shows a lot of the different variations of these things. And, and uh, special ones that were engraved and stuff. But, uh, see, like, I even forgot to show you, like, I have a whole, I have folders of stuff like this. And here is the, here is the Stevens Visible Loader that we just did. See, I didn't show you, but I, I print out, I go online and I print out the patents. This shows all of Redfield's patents and, and they're explained the patents, not just drawings, but it actually explains what is it that's unique about this design that deserves its own patent. And I have that for all different, all different rifles that were of interest to me, different things, different safeties, configurations, all different kind of stuff. So I, I love this. Stuff. I can't print enough of this crap. And uh, I love to read about the advancements and how they change things as they went on down the line. Now this guy, let me show you who this guy was. I'm gonna show you the players here back then in the early 1900s in Marlin. First of all, you had uh, you had these two dudes. These guys were the face of Marlin right here. These were the Marlin brothers, Melon Henry Marlin. 1864 to 1949, and John Howard Marlin, 1876 to 1959. So these guys, this guy was the guy that kind of ran the production of the rifles, and this guy was the guy that kind of ran the uh, sales end of it, from what I, you know, from what I read. There's probably a whole lot more to it than just breaking it down like that, but just as a brief synopsis, and now you get into like some of the designers this guy, he bounced around. He was everywhere, this guy. Andrew Burris. You know who this guy is? This guy supposedly took the picture of Abraham Lincoln that's on the $5 bill. He's got that claim to fame. But this guy bounced around. He designed guns all over the place. Um, he died in 1908. But um, supposedly a lot of his advancements went into this gun. You know what I mean? And uh, here's the real, here's the guy. This is Louis Lobdell Hepburn. We'll just call him L.L. Hepburn. That sounds good. 1932 to 1914. So he died uh, right after this guy. But uh, he's the he's the guy that invented this. He's the guy that he's the guy that uh, invented a lot of these designs, these early Marlin designs. And uh, see, here's one of his patents down here. And they'll just go on and on and showing you here his different his different patents and what made his stuff special with with lever guns mostly. But look, yeah, these are all his patents for uh, different types of magazine systems. I'm going to show you. The, uh, the patent for this particular magazine was from Mr. Marlin himself, though. It's a Marlin patent. But everything else here was Hepburn. So let's see, what should we do first? Let's, let's actually, let's talk about the magazine first so that before we actually take it apart... Now, while this magazine might look different, uh, might look the same as all the others that we're going to... Let me turn it around this way. It's going to kind of look, just by looking at this, it's going to look like we're going to grab a button here. And we're going to pull this out. And it's going to be a tube, just like all the others with a follower in it. However, you notice what's happening when I pull this. You see how this whole outer tube is coming out? Look at it. You see? Now nothing comes out it, it goes it extends all the way look at how long that is it extends all the way and stays attached and what you're basically doing is pulling the outer housing out you're pulling the, this inner housing stays in place it's connected here to the barrel and and there's a there's a relief right down the middle cut down the middle of this tube here for that to go through and you're basically charging this now. This is spring loaded, so this is charged now. And here's your loading port. So I'm going to drop in a couple of snap caps here. These dummy rounds. They say right on them 22 long rifle dummy. It says it right there. It says it right there, dummy. I'm going to put two for now. 
And then this charge is much easier. It's not like those tubes where you got to worry about it going over the rounds now because the rounds are already in there. It's just going up against the spring. This clicks into place. Whatever, I just wanted to put two in there and charge it. But you see how... Now, this magazine, this was not... This was not designed off of the tube magazines that you've seen in the past with me looking at these rifles. Actually, what it was taken from was the older type designs where you actually slid the rounds in a gate on the side and loaded a tube. It's closer to that design than to the removable magazine with the follower inside the tube like that. So... It was an, 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 an blah. It was an adaptation of that type magazine where you load the rounds through a gate and charge them inside of a tube. And Marlin adapted it this way because the twenty twos, especially shorts, especially were too small to manipulate through a little gate like that, and, and they were like just turn, like turning every which way, and it was hard to get them in there. So he adapted that design to work like this to pull it apart. To be able to get the rounds in a gate that was uh, up for up towards the front, so uh, that's pretty interesting. And supposedly, from what I read, that was Marlin that actually invented that. Now, how this comes apart is totally slick. Look at how it folds. Oh, I have to have the hammer open, but it folds open like that. How awesome is that? It has like a, it has like a uh, like a clamshell kind of thing going on there. Well, that wasn't graceful at all, but yeah, it's easier to put it together facing downwards, but then you can't see how cool it is when it opens up. So there's actually a post here that sits inside a relief here, and another one there that goes in here. Well, this is the screw itself. But how cool is that? And then back here, you have the hammer, the stepped uh, ratcheting sear here. See it? And uh, that's simple enough. And then on this side, here's where it gets cool. Now I'm going to see if I could bring you a little closer here. Bear with me if you shake around. Sorry. All right. I'm going to come sit over here. Now check this out. Let me see. Make sure I'm... All right. Now, look at how awesome this design is now. Now to release the bolt... All you got to do is press it on the firing pin. That's a safety device that nothing will happen unless the fire, unless the hammer is lowered, unless the hammer comes home. Otherwise, the rifle stays locked up like as a safety device. Now, you could see that round right there. That's not even where it's supposed to be. Is it? Wait, hold on. Yeah, it is. Because the, the lifter just grabbed it. Wow, that was sick. I... It didn't even look like it was in it was in control of that round, but it was. Well, it's a good thing I put in two because I just ruined that one. So let's let's get that one out. Okay, let's start again. Opening it up um, does not bring around. Hold on a minute. I'm really messing this up. I did put two in there, right? Where's number two? Did that just sneak by and I didn't even see it? No, it didn't come out. Oh, you know why? It has to be closed in order for the second one. No, there it is. Okay. So when you when you open the action, it lets that... See, I didn't have it click closed all the way. When it's click closed all the way, that's what releases. That's when this finger will release the next round. And I wasn't letting it close all the way. See, I have to hold this because this is the spring out, the bolt. So then you could see the elevator down there lifting up that round only on close. When it opens, it doesn't lift it. And then when you close, it lifts it up. See how it puts it perfectly in, in its spot? And then the bolt picks it up. And then that's that's how it has to click home. To Now it would, it would be picking up the next one. Already the next round would be out going into the lifter. And then bang, you pull the trigger. And then it's ready to eject. I mean... How awesome is that? I gotta show you. Let me see if I could lift the. Let me see if I could lift the. Uh, am I still in the camera frame here? Good. Just wanna lift the guide rod off of the bolt. Look at this, the beauty of this design here now. When this bolt comes forward, 
Now, when it cycles, look at the beauty of this design. It's like it's so few parts. When it opens, it just ejects. And then only when it closes does it bring up the next round. Take it off the elevator there and feed it. And then, boom, right down to pick up the next round would already be in there already. That's a, that's a, that's a thing of beauty right there. That's a freaking work of art. And uh, L.L. Hepburn, that's the man right there. Look at that cool uh, ejector over there. Well, I hope I stayed in, in, uh, in camera range that whole time. Yeah, it looks like I did. This is one to uh, just, you don't even have to take it apart to like really be in awe of it. All you really gotta do is just, you know, do the takedown part of it. You know how beautiful this goes back together and how simple. Yeah. So, Marlin. Come back a little. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, Marlin. Yep. Yeah, that's what they were up to. This guy is, uh, this guy is the direct competition of the 1890, the Winchester 1890. And then their subsequent ones, they also have one that was a competitor for the uh, the uh, 12C that we just did a video on. So um, I'll point that out when it comes out. Stay tuned. We'll see if we have that one to uh, show you. Can't let, uh, can't let on. Can't let you know what we got coming up. It's all a secret. So that's Marlin, man. They got some history. They got a lot of cool guns and then... This gun, even later on, became adapted to centerfire versions of it that were designed by uh, L.L. Hepburn. There was a lot going on. There was a lot going on at the time. But this one, skinny as it is, and it's just the sleekest. Oh, they always had just such that beautiful, smooth action. And these parts that, that closed so tightly and just the tolerances on them were so beautiful. And this type of like, this type of steel that was just that shiny kind of tool steel. It was like everything was like made out of the same steel that you would make like a hammer out of. You know what I mean? It was just super strong stuff. And uh, this one, I always loved it. I love shooting this one. It, uh, it's very reliable. It cycles perfectly. And... Uh, Oh, I forgot some of the graphics. This is a this is a cool graphic right here. As I bang it into the table 90 times. There's the Marlin 28 graphic. Gotta love that. And there's the uh, screws where you would put a, one of these specialty sights on there. Never really was much for those things. That, and thank God, because they're very expensive. But uh, I like just like the looks of, I mean, you can't ruin the lines of this rifle with anything. It's gorgeous. Look at the lines on it, you know? So, uh, so that's it. That's the Marlin. Marlin 20A. Yep. And I had to pick one because nobody was telling me what they wanted to see. So get in there, comment, like, subscribe. Uh, click on that notify thing, whatever it is that you could possibly do to enhance your enjoyment of this channel, because I need to know what you guys want to see as far as these 22 goes. I'll get to everything else. There was somebody that was like, I want to see a Remington Model 8. We'll see what we could do. But first, first and foremost, I want someone to be able to look, anyone that's into these 22s, I want them to be able, if they find one that they like, I want them to be able to look back and forward and just see a whole bunch of 22 videos, you know, these vintage 22s. I don't want to just mix them all in. So, trust me, we're going to be here for a while. So if you see anything that uh, you're interested in, if there's a brand that you're interested in, a specific brand, you know, let me know. These are all tied in. Even though Marlin competed with Browning, you know, with, with as far as their uh, designs and stuff like that, and with Winchester or whatever. Marlin produced Browning machine guns for the war effort. Ma Marlin was making machine guns for aircraft. They made aircraft machine guns for, for the war effort. They were awesome with that. 
See if I can find some of this stuff. It's probably not just going to jump right out of the book at me, and that's a shame. Because uh, I don't really know where to look. Oh, uh, here we go. Look. Here. This shows where the... These are all... All these are Marlin guns. These were... These were Browning designed and... Here's a Browning 1918 aircraft machine gun manufactured by Marlin Rockwell Corporation. Imagine how much one of those would go for. Oh, my God. But here. They were called Browning Aircraft Machine Gun manufactured by Marlin Rockwell. There it is. There it is right on it. They were awesome, Marlin. They were uh, one of the top producers for, for the war effort. And uh, this stuff is... They didn't so much compete as they, uh, you know... They just, uh, they had fun with their designs, I'll tell you. They really did. And uh, Marlin was very unique in, during this period, this early period. The later ones have a different feel to them. And uh, maybe one of these days we'll get to that. So talk to me. Tell me what gun you'd like to see. Any questions on this one, go ahead and ask. Uh, anything that I got wrong, go ahead and correct me. And uh, see you next time.